you find it weird acting in your own films? I actually find it kind of humiliating. Roll sound. Mark. Okay, whenever you're ready. Action. You don't think she knows what I'm up to? She's oversimplifying a lot. It's just so rare to pick a real artist's brain. How can you make something if you don't have anything to say? I have something to say. I just think the movie is the only way to say it. It's like she can't stand the fact that I have a single thought about this world. No, it's that I can't stand the thoughts about the world that you have. This has been so fun. You don't love me anymore. Just leave me alone! Now I'm wondering what kind of mind games you're playing with me. He's my husband, okay? Claire, can you just I'm calm, can you calm down a little bit? Me? I've been lying since the second I got here. <laughs> You're in I love with her, you are, I, I know it. it. This is what you wanted, okay? This was going to ruin us. Okay, we're out. I just want to be normal people again. Love Black Bear. It's it's Thank great. You. It left me with so many questions. I watched it with my boyfriend, and we were debating about it for like like days after because it's so it's so interesting. Um, I suppose first things first, you know, what inspired the story? Uh, it's tough to um, to to really pin down uh, the inspiration. I um, I think that um, a lot of it had to do with. Um, taking account of my, um, my life in film. Uh, I, I guess I had been on this career path for something like maybe 20 years when I, when I started to write the movie or the career path is an interesting term for it, <laughs> but um, artistic pursuit and uh, that's mixed with, with career pursuit. And so I think um, I was looking at the sacrifices that I had to make personally and emotionally to, to, um, to engage in, in, in an artistic life. Um, that's not to say that the film is autobiographical, it isn't, but I also couldn't have written the film if I hadn't th lived through um, related experiences um, that have been heightened for the movie. So I think I was kind of taking stock at, at my, um, my life in film and, and it was kind of a dark, uh, at that time it felt like I had kind of sacrificed a lot. So that was, that was one part of it. Um, another part of it is, you know, and also just to know, my wife is also a filmmaker and we made a lot of movies together. So I think also those kind of things found their way in there, although, um, it's a much darker portrait of our, of, of, uh, a romantic entanglement mixed with a film, but you know, I think that informed it as well. And then, uh, and then there was also a desire to do something more unusual and uh, just more creative that drew from more European cinema influences. Um, I had been working as a professional screenwriter in Hollywood for about five years, um, and I had in that time I hadn't written anything for myself to direct. So when I finally had a window to, to write something for myself, I was hungry to do something different and um, unique and not with an unusual kind of structure, not, not the three, typical three act, eight sequence Hollywood structure. And as you say, it's not a typical three act structure. Like I really liked how you have, you know, part one and part two and the way that they're shot is very different as well you know it's a bit more raw and handheld with part two you know, I suppose what was the thinking behind you know taking these sort of parts and shooting them very differently well I wanted we wanted to the two halves to feel uh feel somewhat different and to feel um distinct but we also wanted them to feel like part of the same film so that the experience wouldn't be too discordant, I guess, for the audience. So we arrived at a strategy of doing the first, um, first sequence handheld and then the second sequence 
Uh, I'm sorry, the first sequence. Yeah, the no, no hand. <laughs> first sequence, no handheld. Second sequence, handheld. Um, but we kept the lighting strategy pretty similar. And um, the idea was that uh, we wanted to, we, we were going for realism, heightened realism, I think. And with part one, uh, and we wanted it to escalate. So with part one, I think the movie feels realistic, but it's shot with more classic cinema tools. And then the second part is we wanted it to increase in intensity and increase in realism. And it seemed like the best way to do that would be to go handheld. Um, and there was also a, a consciousness of that the movie is in two parts, but it needs to escalate in the same way that a normal movie might, so that um, you know the audience doesn't lose interest. So there was there was a uh, there was a there was a notion of building an intensity even throughout the two parts, um, with I guess the biggest shift being the handheld in part two. But but there is an escalation in cinematic style and intensity throughout the first and the second. Yeah, it, uh, yeah, it's very stressful, the second part. There's a thing with coffee where the coffee just keeps <laughs> getting yeah. spilled. It just made me anxious every time I saw, <laughs> I saw someone going to get a coffee cup. I just... Yeah, it just really yeah. got to me back there. But one thing I wanted to speak to you about was, you know, so much of the film is open to interpretation. You know, it's very ambiguous. And I, you know, I personally really liked that. I suppose, why was your intention to make it so open-ended and sort of leave it to the audience to make their own mind up about what it means? It wasn't actually my intention to, to do that. Uh, I wanted the movie to be a little mysterious, but I didn't think... It, it's challenging. When you're a writer, you know what you're trying to say and do, and you have to decide how much you think that the audience uh, needs to know or the audience will figure out. And I guess I erred on the side of thinking the audience was maybe more ahead uh, than they were. So it's it's... I wanted the movie to feel mysterious, but I didn't want the audience to be so alienated that they were like, what the fuck is going on here? You know, <laughs> um, but I think, uh, and I think some people did leave the movie feeling that way. Like it was too ambiguous for them and they, they disengaged. And then for people who like ambiguity, I think they really leaned into it. Um, I, I'm one of the viewers who tends to, I tend to try and take a movie the way it presents itself as if it was intended. And um, if a movie is ambiguous, you know, I think it's sometimes fun to think about it in the same way that you would think about one of your dreams that, that seemed very powerful and meaningful, but you couldn't quite pull, pin down why or what precisely it was trying to say. Um, and I think sometimes it's cool to walk away from a movie with that feeling. And it was my intention that the audience feel that way, but I didn't want them to feel so in the dark. I think some of the, um, I think some of the uh, exigencies of the shoot led to um, led to perhaps maybe a little more ambiguity than I intended. For example, the ending with the, with the bear, the ending of part two with the bear, um, that was originally supposed to be. Um, shot very differently so that we would see the bear and Allison in the same frame and that Allison would be sort of charging toward the bear. Um, and then I would cut out. And I think that would have gone a long way into having the audience experience a sense of closure. Um, but I, I wasn't able to shoot that because the bear wouldn't, co wouldn't cooperate. Yeah. <laughs> and we didn't have the budget to do special effects for it either. We didn't have the budget for a really trained bear. We didn't have the budget. So some of these things just happen and you have to, that's the thing about movies. Like you just yeah. have to deal with what. The yeah. You just roll with it. Yeah. yeah. Um, so. I was going to ask you about the bear actually. I was, Cause I want to know what the bear you know, represents to you personally. For me, it's sort of, you know, the film's about creativity, it sort of came at you like writer's block, like it sort of shocks you, like something else coming into your brain that you know, stops that creative process. But I wanted to know what it meant to you. Um, to me, the bear was a sort of multifaceted symbol, but I didn't, it, it came to me in the flow of writing. It wasn't something I had 
preconceived to, to place in the movie. It started when I was thinking about um, the ending of part one. How can I find closure to this, these dynamics and situations I've created? And I decided on the notion of a car crash. And I just thought to myself, well, what would cause a car to crash in the middle of the night in a rural location like this? And bear was the first thing that popped to mind. So it was actually pretty um, pragmatic. You know, just, it was just sort of, when, you're, when, when people write, I don't know about other people, but when I write, it's always a matter of just like, what could really happen here? And uh, there were definitely black bears. There was a lot of black bears in that area. And, uh, and so I thought of it like that. And then I started to think when it occurred to me and when I wrote it, I was like, this is, the bear is actually a really interesting symbol. It's a symbol of death and rebirth, um, which is sort of the theme of the movie, which is the transformation of pain into art, i.e. something positive um, that you can reflect on and maybe move forward in a new direction. Um, so, uh, it was really, yeah, death and rebirth was really the thing, you know, because bears hibernate and they, they come back to life. So, so that was the thing that, that I was, that I was kind of conscious of for part two. I thought, oh, well, this would be a, a good ending here too. And it'll give a sense of, um, you know, I was trying to weave th weave elements of part one into part two in this way that felt um, coherent. So it, it made sense to me from that perspective. And that's why I was saying, I think if I had shot my intended ending of the movie with her charging toward the bear, you'd see that what she was saying, what she was realizing was the answer to your problems is often through your pain. Um, and that's kind of how you're reborn. Um, but like I said, wasn't able to do that ending, so. Uh, well, it, I think it's audiences left to wonder like, what happened? <laughs> I mean, she still walks toward it. Yeah. Um, Anyway. It's, it's implied, isn't it? Um, you, I don't I really, know. You tell me. <laughs> well, I think it is. Um, you know, there's, there's almost like an inception here in a way because you're filming a film, but part of the film is also you know, a film. You know, what are those sort of scenes like to film? And were any of the crew members, actual crew members on the sort of movie set, if you know what I mean? All of the um, people who have lines in the movie are actors with the exception of one character, uh, which is the PA who gives um, Allison her cigarettes at the end of takes. He was the, he was the second AC. Uh, so he was part of the crew. And that was Aubrey's idea. I, I, we wanted somebody, but Aubrey kind of handpicked him. He just had a great personality and, and uh, I don't know, he was sort of like a beloved figure on the set. So <laughs> his name was Hightower. High and he was great. So uh, that's the only crew member that acted in the movie, but all of, all of the extras are our crew. And was it kind of odd filming a, filming a film set, like recreating a sort of experience, but you know, for the movie itself? Not for me. I don't know. It'd be interesting to ask other people. For me, it was kind of easier because we didn't have to hide any of the equipment. Ah, uh, yeah. Yeah, that you know, makes so, sense. So much of your time during the shoot when you're shooting a normal movie is like, where are we going to hide everything? And where can't we shoot because you might see it. Uh, I might see the I might see the lights or I might see whatever. So uh, flags, all these different pieces of equipment. So it was just kind of easier. Like you didn't have to worry. The camera could roam wherever it wanted, and uh, you know. So it sounds fun for sure. <laughs> I want to uh, just quickly speak about the cast. You know, Aubrey is fantastic in the film, as yeah. is you know, Christopher and Sarah. But I understand, you know, Aubrey was involved from really early on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I, I knew her and I, I thought she'd be really interesting to work with because um, she has a great work ethic and she's really, really interested in challenging herself and she's pretty courageous. So um, I just thought she'd be good to work with. And also she's, the way that she expresses herself is, is sort of in line with the characters that I imagined with, uh, in this film, you know, there, it's a lot of indirect expression. It's a lot, she's kind of cryptic and mysterious, like the movie. And what about Christopher and Sarah? Did you think that they were right for those parts? 
Yeah, everybody that ended up in the movie was kind of my, were my first choices, the people I really, really wanted to work with. I'd been wanting to work with Chris for a while. I think he's um, really incredible. Uh, got a lot of range, and uh, he, he's also, um, beside from being like really, really talented, he's a great guy to have around. He's really hardworking, which all of the cast were. And he's also just really creative and funny and... Uh, uh, energetic and kind of just a pleasure to be around and work with. And Sarah, I saw her in a film called Indignation. Uh, it's a Philip Roth adaptation by James Seamus. And um, I just, the performance in it was so uh, astonishing really that I just thought, oh man, I'd love to work with this person someday. And that was maybe five years before Black Bear. So the second I had that script, I was I, I wanted to go after her, and luckily, she was um, with the same agent as Aubrey, so it worked yeah. out. I'll have to check that out. I saw Christopher recently in Possessor, which is mm -hmm. also a great movie, so he's clearly yeah. you know, so talented. It's what you said, he's totally. just got this yeah. range, like such an incredible range there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, one last question, I think we've got time for one more. Um, you know, the image that is being used to promote the movie and, you know, what you see is of Aubrey in this sort of red bathing suit. And, you know, mm -hmm. red's quite a key colour in the movie. We also see, you know, Sarah's character in it as well. You know, where did this sort of, you know, colour come from? And, you know, what does it represent to you? Because it is such a key, you know, colour in the movie. I don't recall if I specified the colour in the script. My guess is that I did not and that the... Uh, the costume designer, Ali Pierce, and um, Tracy Dishman, the production designer, kind of came up with a color scheme that they presented to me. I think red, I think their, their, um, their thinking behind red was that, first of all, it's a bold color, so that when the characters switch costumes in the film, it's memorable. Um, and there was also something I think there's something hot and passionate about the the color, and then also um, the scarlet letter. I think was a reference for them that she was some sort some sort of fallen woman or something like that. Yeah, yeah, the scarlet letter makes sense now. Now that you said it, I, I get it. Like a tainted sort of woman in a way. Yeah, yeah. Uh, um, yeah. Uh, well, thanks for taking the time to speak to me today. It's been a pleasure, and yeah, Black Bear was great. So I really appreciate it. Great to meet you and talk to you, Emily. Thank you.